Okay, let's finally make a start. First, I'd like to acknowledge the first Australians on whose land we meet and whose cultures, which are amongst the oldest continuing cultures in human history, we celebrate. And now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Professor Michael Grubb. Professor Grubb is chair of the International Research Organization Climate Strategies, headquartered at Cambridge University, where he is also a senior research associate at the Faculty of Economics. He's a leading expert in industry competitiveness under the EU emission trading scheme and has been uh, leading research on industrial competitiveness and carbon leakage for the last four years. His former positions include chief economist at the Carbon Trust, professor of climate change and energy po policy at Imperial College London, and head of energy and environment at Chatham House. And he continues to be associated with these institutions. 2008, he was appointed to the UK Climate Change Committee established under the UK Climate Change Bill to advise the government on future carbon budgets and to report to Parliament on their implementation. Michael Grubb is author of seven books, 50 journal research articles, and numerous other publications. It's with great pleasure that I welcome Michael Grubb to speak to us today. Well, thanks very much indeed, uh, Will. Uh, and, uh, Se and Stefan and others and all of you for coming uh, and listening uh, in, in the room and I believe on the webcast. Um, we are starting a little late and I have actually was going to pack quite a, quite a bit in, so I'll skip the preliminaries about, about this cover, um, see if I can actually get this beast to work, which appears to be sitting there staring at me. Ah, okay, right. I'm going to start with two sort of scene-setting views around this issue before I get into the sp sort of specific structure of the talk I want to cover, uh, which in turn locates carbon pricing in, in a broader debate. Um, now, this might seem a slightly odd place to start this, this chart, and uh, the last thing I want to do is give you a lecture on science, because uh, numerous people at this university know infinitely more than I. But I've always found the interface between the science and politics very interesting, and of course that affects the context of the policy debate. What I tend to see is what I now think of as three sort of social conceptions and, uh, and uh, uh, approaches to climate change, of which the first is broadly a kind of don't see it happening, uh, don't know, don't really care very much, life's very busy, I want to get out with, on with other things, including obviously making money. Uh, underlying belief, it's not proven, what you don't know won't hurt you, etc. Um, I've been maybe a, a, a little casual in my use of the resulting strategy, um, but I think we are at a very interesting moment because although scientists have actually been saying that for well over a decade they are able to measure and track impact of climate change, it seems to me that socially we're really only sort of now bridging the point at which climate impacts for significant people are rising above the level of natural variability. Of course, in Australia, you've had some pretty extreme events recently and sort of, I don't know exactly how that's fed into to the debate here, given all of the surrounding uh, politics and uncertainties. The central zone that I'm most used to inhabiting is a sort of cost, is the next layer down in which one is looking forward, projecting climate impacts on the basis of science tangible, attributable costs, you try and weigh out the costs and benefits, uh, and the straight economic prescription is, well, you want to act up to the social cost of carbon emissions. You treat this as an externality, a cost imposed by carbon on our social systems, and uh, you just need to measure that number and put a carbon price up to that level. It's really very straightforward until you try and do it. Um, the first thing is you, you have a debate as to what it is that you're measuring, where, and how do you measure it, and how do you compare, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's long economics debate about this, and, and I think best captured by uh, someone who did a report for the UK government and ended up concluding that the social cost of carbon with considerable confidence is probably somewhere between ten and $1,000 per tonne of CO2. Which unfortunately for policymakers is not quite what they wanted to be told. The UK has ended up with a, a carbon, shadow carbon price of 70 pounds per tonne of CO2 as its best kind of guess in the middle of this impossibly wide range. Um, but that's how economists have thought about it. What I think is interesting is that at the third level, 
there is a whole strata of society thinking about this in a totally different way, uh, which is partly the scientific community that has always seen this much more in terms of risk management, but increasingly now a security community, which is seeing that this issue has real potential for disruption of social systems, destabilize things, in which case actually economics really struggles because economics tends to be concerned with measuring costs and benefits within a stable social and legal framework. And, and as if those social frameworks start to get stressed by collapse, threats to food security, uh, forced migration, it's a very different issue. And this issue, climate change, is now something which in security circles is regularly described as a threat multiplier. There are many stresses, many threats to security, and this is going to make a lot of them a lot worse. The real policy challenge is that there's perhaps a generational time gap between each of those steps. And so policy is trying to look ahead, grapple with these things. Um, and at, at a time when society is sort of still saying, well, I, I don't see it on my doorstep. Um, with the possible exception of, uh, you know, Australia and, and other places that have suffered uh, extreme events. Now, I gave a talk at Lowy Institute yesterday. Uh, I'm not going to repeat that. This is a sort of one line, uh, a one page summary of, in a sense, the key things that I was arguing that we are approaching the, or I think we have just reached the end of what I call, in, in a book I'm trying to write, the age of innocence about the sheer scale of this challenge and indeed many other things in the, the kind of world we've got used to over the last quarter century. Um, in the context of climate change, one of the key beliefs was the challenge was a classic economic collective action problem where we had to negotiate a deal about sharing the costs of cutting emissions. And that was the fundamental challenge. And then you just did that, and you agreed a burden sharing formula and agreed who was doing how much. This is actually a far more interesting problem. It is about decisions on policy, investment, risks, and returns, in which I think it's increasingly clear that politics has a much bigger role to play than economics uh, in determining what countries do and don't do, say, etc. cetera. Uh, another belief of the age, action would be led by the industrialized world with others following. Makes sense, seems the moral position, good logic, the entire framework has been built around that assumption. That approach is dead. The US federal government is not going to act on climate change in, in, in a substantial way for a very long time, and we better get used to it and adjust to that reality. What we actually have is a very fragmented world in which the emerging economies are moving, frankly, faster than I can keep up with in terms of what they're doing on climate change. Um, um, we'll come back to that briefly. Then there are three policy beliefs, each of which I want to say briefly about, but I'll focus most on carbon pricing. Those three policy beliefs were that energy efficiency is really, it's an, it's an easy free lunch. You know, we improve energy efficiency, all the technologists, engineers say, really good returns. I think the evidence is that it is, energy efficiency really is very good for the economy, but it's not easy. It's actually really quite tricky and sophisticated to work out why are peaceful waste so wasteful, and what sensibly can one do about that? We then have carbon pricing, where the idea was, well, we, it just internalizes the external cost of carbon, and that drives low carbon investment, and, and job done. Why would you need anything else? Actually, I think we've learned that carbon pricing is much more complex in terms of its role within the challenge. And the final, and to some extent, the opposing belief was that technology will save us. Um, and, uh, well, technology is really crucial, but one thing we've learned is that innovation broadly is a result of good policy. It's quite hard to force effectively or efficiently by governments. It's quite slow to emerge, and it's a very complicated process in itself. Um, so, that's all right, we can finish, you can go home now. Those are the main points I wanted to make. Um, if you're not too bored, I would invite you to stay for the rest, because I now want to sort of actually really start building up the picture that leads to some of those conclusions and zeroing in on the role of carbon pricing. And I will do so in terms of the, the, the points laid out here. Um, and w which the first, and again, some of this is attempt to very briefly give you a context for the carbon pricing issue. So in this technical part of the talk, let me start by just laying a few facts about how the world has developed over the last couple of decades in terms of per capita emissions in different regions, which is the vertical axis. The squiggly lines are how various countries have developed uh, over time. The horizontal axis is how their economies have grown in GDP terms. 
the interesting thing about this chart, in my view, is that given a standard set of economic assumptions about equilibrium costs and growth, you would expect the industrialized world to be converging. There is absolutely no evidence of convergence, in fact, the opposite. By and large, the industrialized world clumps into two groups. You have the US uh, leading the principal one with emissions at about 20 uh, tons of CO2 per person. And it's been really pretty stable at that level for well over a decade. And you have all the European countries and Japan and like to that that have broadly been, again, relatively stable at around 10 tons of CO2 per capita. Absolutely no sign of convergence. Uh, Australia has clearly been making good progress to join the US camp. But apart from that, most of the others have been pretty stable in per capita emissions. You have the developing countries uh, in racing rapidly, but so far they've not broached that sort of 10 tons per capita ceiling. Um, Korea would be a very interesting study now in terms of how its economy has motored well into the range of industrialized countries. It's still around that level. There is a subtext in here about trade, carbon trade, production consumption. Uh, the data that I've got suggests that e the, the EU uh, trade effects account for about 20-ish percent of the difference, but no way explained. So on a consumption basis, Europe is probably consuming about 12 tons of CO2 per capita, but it's still a very big gap from, from the sort of 20 uh, in, in US and Australia. And the US is also a bigger net consumer than its producer, Australia, fractionally the other way around. Um, but point, it's quite interesting, UK and Australia have actually had very similar economic growth per capita over this period, radically different emission trends. Lots of reasons, obviously resource dependency uh, in, in, the US, in Australia. Those, those trends and those divergences are also reflected in carbon productivity, broad crude measure of, of energy efficiency in the economy. Uh, the, the world as a whole has been getting more efficient in its use of carbon per, per unit of economic output. Uh, three broad groups appear. The former centrally planned economies of China and the, US, and the uh, USSR, fantastically inefficient, uh, improving rapidly as their economies develop. A uh, bit of a blip in China, at least in carbon terms, but it seems to be now heading back on course, and its goal is to improve 40 to 45 percent over the next 10 years. Um, at the opposite end, you've got the countries that broadly took on caps under the Kyoto Protocol, binding uh, uh, caps, um, which have been you know, substantially more efficient than the others in their use of carbon, remain so, and quite interesting that over the decade, the EU 15, which is the West European countries, have actually edged a bit ahead of Japan. Um, you can see the track of the, the dotted lines of the new member states of the EU, the former East European countries, very rapid improvement as they started to integrate economies along market lines. Um, India is a very interesting story going slightly up and now starting to come down again. My guess is that India will be migrating towards the lower group uh, fairly quickly over the next decade or two. Um, much less clear in terms of US, Australia. Now, one of the things that underlies this is price difference. I do not wish to pretend this is the only thing at all, as you will gather. But a very interesting thing happens when you look cross-country at vertically average energy prices, this is dollar per ton of oil equivalent, uh, against the average energy intensity, kilograms of oil per unit of GDP. And uh, I've got the, 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 the blue spots there are all the different EU countries. You've got Japan on the line. You can see the Australia, the US, etc. cetera. Um, now, what is so interesting about this is if you look at the, the broadly the line from Japan through the EU to Australia to USA, uh, you've got what economists would call an elasticity of uh, about minus one. It basically means 20% higher energy prices use 20% less energy. An interesting statistic, because when you multiply the two, what you find out is the amount of money that countries spend on energy per person is basically invariant according to price. Higher prices, lower consumption, the amount that people spend on energy is, is constant, irrespective of their energy price. Um, now, in fact, overall, this chart has a bigger number than minus one, but that's slightly distorted by the East European countries. Um, so I didn't want to 
pay too much emphasis on that or claim that higher energy prices would result in cheaper bills. There's a lot of evidence higher energy prices do not in the long run increase the overall bill. But there are important caveats around that because when economists try and measure the same number within a country, they say, oh, it's about nine or minus 0.2 or something. You know, only get a 20, you know, 2% reduction for a 10% increase in energy prices. What's going on here? Partly time, takes time for prices to work through. And I think the evidence is, it is also that price has many impacts in an economy, not just on the immediate behavior of people who say, oh dear, I'm facing a higher price, I'm going to change the way I uh, run my car or turn my thermostat. It has structural implications for the choices people make. Um, it has a societal implication that, hey, actually, you know, energy is a little bit more sort of valuable than we thought, and we'd like governments to be doing stronger building standards, high-speed trains instead of superhighways because it's more expensive to drive. Lots of structural and infrastructural effects, and also the behavioral effects that just, well, you know, you're more conscious of energy, so you think a bit more about it when you do things. But nevertheless, I think the, the, the fact of this diagram, the data here, is very important and economically, the gap between elasticity measured internationally compared within a country is very important to understand for what's driving it and what it says about the role of prices and non-price policies that may be associated with a societal recognition that energy is not, not free and infinite. Now, that data that I showed showed uh, that there was no convergence in industrialized countries. If anything, slight hints of the opposite, and I want to put a hypothesis on the table here, which is that we are beginning to see the emergence of a fundamental structural division in the world's energy systems. I'm not gonna explain the diagram at the top here. One or two of the more techie energy systems people might recognize that it comes from a 10-year-old paper by the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis, which I think was one of the best pieces of, of energy research of the uh, past decade, and also a superb illustration of how lousy academics are at communicating what it is they're actually saying, because nobody actually understands the diagram. I can tell you it's about, but what I've actually done is translate it in the lower half of the diagram to say that the evidence is that as easy oil depletes, and I use that word, you can say conventional oil reserves if you want to be technical about it, as the stuff that just comes out of the ground when you drill a hole down, as we run out of that, and we are starting to run out of it, um, the world can go in various directions. And you can go in a low carbon direction whereby you, you move towards natural gas, you develop low carbon sources, you, you get into fuel cells, you get into all of the smart things that low carbon engineers work on and learn how to do that cheaply. Or you can go the other direction. You, you can dig away at the carbon frontier, you gouge more stuff out of the ground when it refuses to just come up of its own accord when you drill the hole, you get into tar sand, you're going to process that, you may get into coal-based sim fuels, you, you get into all sorts of infrastructure associated with digging lots of carbon out of the ground and dumping it into the atmosphere. And you can learn how to mess up the atmosphere much more cheaply than we do at present. Yeah? So, the world's energy system can go in one of two ways. And in fact, the interesting thing about the technical chart at the top is it basically said the most expensive thing to do is sort of sit in the middle and do a bit of the high carbon and a bit of the low carbon and not learn to do either properly or wholesale and mix up infrastructures between high carbon and low carbon infrastructure. Um, what are the economics going on here? Um, you'll hear some people say, oh, low carbon future is much cheaper, much better. I think it's much more complicated than that. Um, we don't know is the first answer, I would argue, because there's too much learning and uncertainty out there to be done. What I think we can almost certainly say is that low carbon futures are more capital intensive and less fuel dependent, uh, and the reverse of high carbon futures. Cheaper to build, but you then face all sorts of issues around fuel prices, instability in the oil markets, and et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a political choice defined partly by how far ahead is your society gonna look. And how do you value capital? And do you use a 15% discount rate or a 5% discount rate when you're looking at these kind of choices? I think, a hypothesis, the data that I showed you will be viewed by history as the first identifiable moment of this bifurcation in energy systems, in which Europe uh, and a number of other countries are really determined to push their societies down the low carbon road in the face of high oil prices, and certain others will go in the default trajectory that we've got carbon intensive industries, 
and they, they want to and wait, make their money by digging further along the high carbon frontier. Just to start moving on from that conceptual to the framework of emerging international action, uh, and I'll wrap in some stuff about the UK strategy. This is going to be embarrassingly brief, but I just want to give you a flavour of how much the world is changing. Who is acting? Who's doing stuff? EU, I'll come back to. California, um, you may know that at the same time as, as the uh, congressional votes, uh, Proposition 23, I think it was, in California to roll back their emissions cap and trade got comprehensively rejected by the electorate. California is going ahead with a cap and trade scheme. Brazil is acting strongly, uh, is really moving to be you know, the leading emerging economy in the low carbon business. Uh, then you see a host of Asian uh, developments. Korea has the most green of any of the stimulus packages after the financial crisis. Uh, I was talking to someone yesterday emphasizing the steel, steel industry in Korea appears to have a totally different view of both the technological possibilities and the need to start decarbonizing the steel sector as part of a national effort. India is clearly, I think, whatever its diplomats say, that they have no responsibility for this problem. On the ground, they are doing stuff very fast, partly because they're terrified of oil dependence and they've discovered their coal reserves aren't what, uh, what they were thought to be. Um, that includes a trading scheme for the heavy energy sectors and power. China is very complicated. Uh, you probably hear a lot more than we'd have time in numerous lectures. Um, but it has got low carbon development zones with populations, frankly, that are probably similar to Australia when you add them up. Um, and its five-year plan clearly identifies green low carbon technology as a core part of Chinese industrial strategy. Uh, energy and carbon pricing is an essential part of what's happened in Europe and is going. Uh, we see the core role of renewables. Sao Paulo, incidentally, in Brazil, has a carbon cap for the state of Sao Paulo with a population of 30 million people. Um, and so there are all sorts of stuff emerging in Asia. Lots of stuff going on in piloting, planning, ETS. Um, don't have time to go into that, but it's just really interesting. Frankly, that world is moving too fast for me to keep up properly. A little bit about the UK view on this. Uh, and for those wanting more depth, there's the PowerPoint that I gave yesterday at the other talk in Sydney. Broadly, let me just cut to the chase on this, which is the UK Climate Change Act of two, set two years ago, huge bipartisan support in Parliament, something like 500 for 50 against, it's the rough ratio, um, includes a legal commitment for the UK to cut emissions by 80% by mid-century. That's written into primary legislation, it'd be almost impossible to undo. And the Climate Change Act sets up a rolling program and structure for the which requires the government to announce carbon budgets five years ahead on the trajectory towards that, that requirement. Um, and then the Climate Change Committee's job is to, to analyze that, analyze the strategy, and monitor the UK's progress towards that goal. And one of the things that we did on the Climate Change Committee was look carefully at the economics of the trajectory and say, well, you know, at best, most people draw a straight line. You draw a straight line between now and 2050, you start off at 2 or 3% a year reductions. In the last decade, you're looking at 7 or 8% a year reductions. Just do the maths. It is almost certainly better econo economics to try and get closer to an exponential constant 3 4% a year emission reductions. Um, otherwise, you just backload horrible costs when things get tougher. I think I don't have time to go into the details of the scenarios. It's like a second to sort of cast your eye. This is an indication of the sectoral breakdown, the look at what different sectors could contribute, et cetera. And I did want to stress a central role for decarbonization of the power sector. On the left-hand side, you have the emissions intensity per kilowatt hour mapped out in the UK strategy. Huge reduction between now and 2030. On the right-hand side, you have electricity consumption, which, given the scope for strong policies on electricity efficiency, may be held roughly constant for a couple of decades. But the architecture behind this is then electricity is rolled out into transport and potentially heating as well, which seems to be the best strategy for getting down to really deep reductions. You can't go there unless you first decarbonize the power sector, hence a, a deep focus on decarbonizing the power sector, which will bring me to carbon pricing, but it needs to be understood in a slightly broader policy context, which is what I now want to lay out. I think it is 
useful at this point to return to this concept that there are different timescales we're operating on. I touched on it from a climate impact standpoint. Now I want to touch on it from an economics response standpoint. We have a kind of short-term world around particularly energy efficiency stuff that looks like we should be able to do it pretty quickly, get it in place, very cost-effective. Associated with that, actually, you're generally dealing with non-optimal behavior by consumers or non-optimal markets and market failures, barrier busting. I'll wrap that under a concept of behavioral economics. Over the time scale of years to decades, what you're really looking to do is substitute low carbon investments for high carbon investments. Um, and that is, that's the realm economics deals with very easily. You, you change relative prices, people will use relative different input factors. Very straightforward. You know exactly what you're doing, where the optimums lie, how much it would cost, etc. But in the long term of several decades, we've got another whole basket of things that need attention. What kind of infrastructure are we building? What kind of innovation do we have? I'll be talking in a smaller seminar about the economic underpinnings of this, but one thing I'll just say verbally before I show data tomorrow is the energy sector, along with buildings, is amongst the least innovative sectors in our economy. The, the research and development spend in pharmaceuticals relative to turnover is about 20%. In IT, it's, it's above 10%. In energy, it's below 1%. We, we are seeking radical innovation in some of the least innovative sectors in our economy. That is a serious challenge. Simply sticking a carbon price on is not going to solve that challenge. Um, the analytic zone that you are now in, if you're looking over decades, infrastructure and innovation is not a nice equilibrium carbon price defined world. It's a world where, frankly, the best analysis we've got is around evolutionary economics. How do systems evolve? What is the path dependence? What is the lock-in created by earlier decisions on infrastructure? What is the politics created by the incumbent industries that will determine what politically can and cannot be done in the short term? Um, and this, as I say, I'll delve in more detail in a small meeting tomorrow, but there's multiple three-layered economics underpins a basic contention that building a low-carbon economy is not necessarily more expensive, it's just different. Countries have policy and political choices to make about how their systems evolve. Which brings me to the policy instruments framework that here, um, I've, I've put those three levels, sorry, I think I've flipped the chart upside, you know, the, the order's reversed top to down. But um, mapping against that, we have three types of policy instruments. Uh, Public-led investments, which I don't see any alternative for public-led investments in relation to infrastructure and innovation in particular. That's the major determinant of where and how those kind of choices get made. In the middle one, the central pillar, these are the three pillars of policy, you have carbon pricing, which is the fundamental instrument that drives uh, substitution of low, inv low carbon investments for, for high ones. But it has an impact on innovation and in in uh, incentives, and it has an impact on energy efficiency. On the right-hand side, you've got a basket that I've never quite worked out to call, but it's, it, it's all around the non-optimality of economic behavior, uh, individuals, corporate inefficiencies, market failure, tenant-landlord splits, split incentives in the economic system, generally the fact that when you look closely, we're nothing like as optimal as we like to pretend we should be. And what can you do about that? Now, let me make quite a strong comment here. I think that there still remains quite a class of economists who think if you get a carbon price in, you've done the job. That is simply not true. Um, an analogy a senior executive at BP once said to me is carbon pricing is the backbone of a climate policy. But if you want to know how much it needs other stuff, just think of a skeleton in the desert. Right? If you don't have those other stuff that provide the infrastructural context and the technologies which allow people to substitute high for low carbon options, if you allow people to just, you know, the, the structures don't line up the incentives properly, carbon prices like, you know, just, just doesn't cut, cut the mustard, if you know the old English expression. On the other hand, it has to be said that you know, there may, may be economists who've been rather too simplistic that carbon price needs to be flanked by what I believe in Australia is called complementary instruments. I would rather prefer it that there is a triad of instruments. If you don't have that triad, sooner or later your whole policy system falls over. There also appear to be in Australia some people who think that carbon pricing is irrelevant, and all I can say is they're not just limited in economics, they appear not to know any economics. I mean, you, you cannot solve this problem without a carbon price. In the long run, we, if we've got market economies, people have to know carbon is going to get more expensive. 
It's just that it is necessary but not sufficient. What I think is very interesting uh, is to dig a little bit more deeply in this policy triad. Well, I've used a sort of real shorthand here for, for the, you know, the long, long to, uh, to short-term issues and the three policy pillars running across. Because what you really realize is carbon pricing is at the center of this network in various ways. Um, in uh, it does, cap and trade scheme will reveal a lot about the actual costs of cutting carbon. And frankly, you never know until you try and you find out. I mean, the European trading scheme has consistently ended up with lower carbon prices than anyone projected, given the caps. Um, it also gives some motivation, so, and, and it can provide funding for infrastructure innovation in a low carbon direction. Carbon caps can generate a lot of revenue, carbon taxes can. It also provides some motivation for people to get off their butt and look at how efficiently or inefficiently they are using energy, hence it's very effective at breaking some of the behavioural barriers down and motivating governments to do more to improve the efficiency of particularly the end use markets. And then you get other interactions obviously between government expenditure affecting you know, other things about how companies and people see and think and perceive the issues and values and the public feedback to the government decisions. Um, but, but I think the role of a combination of prices and revenues are instrumental to delivering the other two pillars as well. And those other two pillars in turn help make it more politically acceptable to go further on carbon pricing. If you think back to that chart I showed on prices versus intensity, it's not just that some regions have higher carbon, higher prices, it's actually because they are more efficient, it is more politically manageable to have higher prices as well. So there's a deep interaction between efficiency and, and pricing. As I said, it comes back to the data on that chart that actually countries with 20, 30% higher energy prices don't end up spending any more on energy. They just get 20, 30% more efficient. So to then move towards uh, sort of the more, political end of, so what have we actually learned from attempts to do carbon pricing? Um, well, just a very, very quick reminder for those. Uh, I mean, I know that I think Jill Duggan and some other people have been in Australia talking about the European experience, so I won't repeat on that. For those interested, incidentally, well, it's probably not relevant unless if you happen to be in Sydney on Friday, we're launching a report on 10 insights from the European trading scheme um, with the university, uh, UNSW. Um, this shows the outline structure, uh, the European trading scheme puts a cap on power and heavy industry in the European Union, uh, that means it caps about 40, a bit over 40% of overall European emissions, does not cap total European emissions, they're capped under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, that's the 2005 number I've shown in the middle there, uh, incidentally a study by, the, by MIT estimates that the EU ETS cut emissions by 50 to 100 million tonnes of CO2 in its first year. That is a big hit relative to an enormous ensemble of other policies. Uh, it's difficult to disentangle because there was over-allocation too much, and so hindsight, you're saying, well, how much is over-allocation, how much was real abatement? You have to go into a lot of detail to disentangle the two. Going forward to 2020, uh, Europe is currently on the, the, the higher of those two bars, which is a commitment to cut European emissions by 20%. This illustrates the division between ETS sectors and others, the capped sectors and the non-capped. Um, Europe also has potentially on the table an offer to move to 30%, somewhat contingent upon what other countries do. European Union, if, if I'd say there was one stroke of genius in the European trading scheme, it was to acknowledge that it's bound to start off badly and therefore design it in phases so that you can improve over time and learn. And I think the social science studies of this issue, the climate issue, say, look, this is so complicated, the single most important thing is to acknowledge the complexity of it and therefore to design systems which can develop over time. Um, I think one problem the US legislation did is it tried to fix everything for the next 50 years because the Democrats were so terrified of the Republicans getting into power. And that just made it too ambitious to be powerful. Um, so Europe started with a three-year phase one, which has a slightly embarrassing history that I'm happy to take questions on if you, if you want, but basically there were shed loads of free allowances thrown at everybody. Um, phase two got rather better the next five years, you can see there. Um, we got to grips a little bit with the fact that we were giving too many free allowances to the power sector in particular that seemed to be making windfall profits that I'll touch on. 
Um, frankly, others got uh, everything they asked for to pretty close. All this was done by the individual member states. And here's where I start to move from politics to economics. The European trading scheme is a scheme that spans 27 sovereign states. That's quite something to get a common carbon price across 27 sovereign states. The fundamental political origins of it were that the EU had begun to get really quite serious about wanting to do stuff on climate change. Um, and there were a couple of problems. Various different member states were doing different things in different ways. And industry was starting to say, look, this is, this is messy. We're supposed to be a free trade zone. We don't want to deal with all these different jurisdictions doing different things. And then Europe was in the midst of talking about, well, how much do we actually do? I mean, state sovereignty is really important. When President Bush announced that the Kyoto Protocol was rejected, it was dead. And anyway, these stupid Europeans were all talk and no action and weren't actually doing anything serious at all, which is a great incentive for the European heads of state to say, what, what? No, no, we're serious, honest, we're serious. We're gonna do, what are we going to do? I'm caricaturing a little here, but the solution was if Europe needs to show the world it's serious, it needs to cap these emissions, and if European industry is getting worried about the proliferation of messy bits and pieces, you need a central European system. And so some very fast work, footwork by some very able uh, economists uh, in, in the European Commission said, okay, here's the solution. We'll have a harmonized EU-wide trading scheme that keeps industry happy in terms of the market, but to keep the governments happy, each government can decide how many allowances they give out and who they give them to. Because that's money, and sovereign states don't like to give up money. Well, six years later, the story was very different. Sovereign states had given out lots of money, lots of free allowances, had a horrible, messy political battle over whether it was consistent with the Kyoto Protocol. The European Commission ruled that it wasn't. The European Commission imposed rules to cut back national allocations, with member states having spent years negotiating with their industries, all the fine print. And by 2007 to 8, the fascinating transformation is the 27 member states of the European Union it said, God, these national allocation plans are a complete nightmare. Please, European Commission, will you take these powers? We do not want to have to deal with another bloody round of national allocation plans. And so Europe has ended up with a centralized system, not only in the market, but in terms of how the allowances are given out. Because the messiness of trying to give out free allowances, particularly in a harmonized market where you kind of looked over your shoulder and the steel industry was saying, hey, you can't do that to us. Look at what the next door country is doing. Um, it was just impossible. And European states, frankly, the death of the national allocation plans in Europe is, I think, a fascinating political story that member states wanted to get rid of that responsibility so as to have a consistent, harmonized approach to who gets how many allowances right across Europe. And the thing the European Commission then did was say, okay, we've learnt, we've learnt a lot. One of the things we've learnt is the power sector will always pass through the opportunity cost of carbon, um, even if we give them free allowances, because frankly, it'd be bad economics for them to price electricity below the marginal cost, the opportunity cost of do I run a coal plant or not? Well, it's, you've, got to pay the, you've got to reflect the carbon cost. Result, massive windfall profits in the power sector. So along with the centralization of European allocation came a decision that it's the end of the free ride for the power sector. They will face full auctioning uh, as from 2013. And that is the green bar that you see coming in. That is the volume of allowances to be given out under the, the declining cap uh, to 2020. Um, there were some derogation, the bit at the bottom, the, the, you can the colour you can hardly see is derogations for Eastern European countries who said, this is outrageous, particularly Poland, we're coal intensive, we need to give out free allowances. And it was a political deal, so they said, yeah, over time, but you have to decline towards zero. It's entirely unclear how many of the East European member states are actually going to use that opportunity to give out free allowances because they're beginning to understand the economics better and realise it doesn't make economic sense. The price will go up of electricity anyway, will be reflect the carbon costs. Does the state want the money or do they want the industry to have the money? Um, then the blue bits in the middle are other manufacturing sectors, which is what I want to start now zeroing in on. Um, let me just sort of explain this slightly odd diagram. I would argue that if governments understood this diagram, they would be in an infinitely stronger place in terms of deciding how many allowances to give out or how much compensation. What it shows vertically is the profit margin of an industrial sector. 
as affected by carbon costs, which is affected by free allocation. So, so uh, I don't know if I've actually got a pointer here, but um, sort of the top left of the parallelogram, sorry, the, the left-hand side of it, current profit margin of a sector maybe is around 13%. You start a carbon pricing system, give them 90% or more for free, and they face some electricity cost, their profits go down a little bit. If they have no free allocation, the profits will go down a lot more. That's the bottom left-hand corner. But sectors won't necessarily just sit there. They may do something to product prices, which is moves you to the right along this diagram. So if you like, you can think the vertical axis is government decisions about the level of free allocation. The horizontal axis is industry decisions about pricing, given the existence of a carbon market. And the essential point about this is, for anybody who wants to know what will the cost of this system be, you've got to say, no, tell me the mix of free allocation and the industrial sector structure which determines pricing and I can tell you how much loss or profit this sector may make. If you're an electricity sector, you behave in the way I described, you end up at the top right of this chart if you've been given lots of free allowances and your profitability goes up hugely. If you are a sector that has no free allocation and is incredibly trade exposed so that you feel you can't wiggle an inch in terms of your product prices, you end up at the bottom left and your profitability collapses. And I think every industry logically would end up in a different place in this parallel, well, well, that diagram there, that one. Um, and that is what logically you need to understand to have negotiations about how much compensation is required given the ability of a sector to pass through carbon costs into its product or not, as the case may be. Obviously, if and as an industry raises product prices, that's where the competitiveness issue uh, comes in. What can one do about the competitiveness issue? Well, I've talked about free allocation, and frankly, that's what the world has talked about when it's tried to do carbon pricing on the energy-intensive sectors. Um, I don't have a lot of time to go into to, sort of depth about sector by sector. Uh, let me just make a, a scoping comment that I think one thing's very clear from all the analysis is we're not talking about massive economy-wide GDP competitive effects. We're talking about half a dozen to a dozen major primary emitting industries. Now, there is a big structural difference between UK and Australia. Fully acknowledge that. In UK, the amount of GDP locked up in these big resource-intensive industries is less than 1% of GDP. I think in the Ghana statistics in Australia, the equivalent number is about 5% of GDP. And they're all the big ones, you know, it's steel, it's, it's cement, it's aluminium, etc. So, but the emphasis is to deal with this, you do not need to deal with every damn thing that comes in or leaves the country. You need to deal with trade in big, heavy commodities. That is where the issue lies. What are your options where you think you do have a problem? Well. Structurally, actually, you've only got three options, which is one of the interesting things. Logically, you can take the carbon cost out again. You say, well, we've created this carbon pricing system, but oh dear, it will have this competitive leakage problem, and uh, therefore I want to do something to take the carbon cost out again. So technically speaking, that would be conditional free allocation, conditional in proportion to if you produce more, you get more free allowances, etc., etc. Uh, the middle one is, I don't know, we've got a much better solution, which is we've just got to get the whole world to put the same carbon price on all of its traded products at the same time, in the same way, at the same time, when. And you, you end up concluding that we never get there if everybody waits for everybody else to act at the same time, even on a sector basis, let alone all economy. You know, the idea that you can get 200 countries to agree to impose a carbon cost on all their steel production at the same time, the same level, same et cetera, et cetera, it's fantasy. You know, I mean, we've, we've had a long period of uh, talk about sectoral agreements. The one underlying conclusion is they may do lots of interesting things, but they're not going to price carbon. So the middle one is, is, I think, a false option, or rather it's an objective which we would like to end up at after a decade or two or three of journeying of countries doing some more sensible and plausible things, of which the other, and the only third option that we have is you do something at the border, which means that when stuff is in the country, it's all facing a carbon price at the point of consumption, or when it's exported, you give the carbon cost back that was paid on production upon export. 
So you maintain a proper carbon pricing for all consumption in a region, and you take out the carbon cost upon export. That's border adjustments. Um, and frankly, it is the logical economic thing to do. Um, and I'd put it a bit more strongly than that. We're in a world in which we're looking at different countries moving at different speeds and potential building of a co coalition of countries doing carbon pricing to really move their economies in a low-carbon direction. If a coalition of low-carbon economies is expected to price its own producers and not price importers, that is not politically or economically sustainable. Sooner or alternatively, if they're expected to exempt everything that can threaten to move, you cannot build a low-carbon economy. Sooner or later, the world has to get to grips with this border-related carbon issue. So, against that backdrop, I'm going to canter through some myths and realities, and then I'll close for questions. Um, sorry that it starts at number three. It was drawn from another presentation. Just to be clear about these, these, these two categories of options. Leveling down the cost with free allocation. First, let's be clear. It's a myth that free allocation is free. It is not. It's actually quite expensive. Um, a couple of reasons. Uh, for, oh, sorry, that's the same one. Free allocation isn't effective. It can be, but the problem is it, your free allocation may not actually align with the thing you're trying to fix. The easiest example is in cement, for various reasons. In the EUETS, we are probably at, ri at risk of giving, giving out eight years of free allowances to the cement industry, and the ones internally protected by transport costs will say, gee, thanks, we're like electricity, we're protected from trade, we'll do marginal cost pricing, and we'll make lots of windfall profits and be very, very happy. And if they're near a port, they'll say, wow, these free allowances, do you know what? If it goes above 20 euros a tonne, it's more valuable to sell carbon allowances than to sell cement. We'll flog the allowances, close down our plant, and import cement instead. That's not a very good advertisement for emissions trading and free allocation haven't solved the problem. It's not as simple as that. The EU is making technical adjustments to solve that problem, the result is you end up with a really complicated, messy system, which is a bit more like the Australian approach, the more you produce, the more allowances you get. You have another problem, which I don't really have time to go into, but it's who actually gets the free allowances for what. And you dig into how cement is made, and it goes through clinker that then gets mixed into cement and goes out for use. And, and you basically have no sensible economic way of actually stopping carbon leakage um, with free allocation without destroying the incentives that you're trying to create in the cement sector. Um, it's a bit different for some of the other sectors, fortunately. And one of the emphasis out of our work is you need different solutions for each sector. You need to tailor it if you want a good approach to these half dozen key sectors. Uh, the other myth around free allocation, as I said, is, is the idea that it's free. It's not. You protect the energy intensive sectors of an economy, the other sectors have to work harder to achieve any given target. And as I indicated or hinted in cement, it actually is inevitably starts to undermine the intensive to decarbonize. And some of these sectors, whatever you hear from some of the industries, have a lot of potential to reduce their emissions, either in the manufacturing process or in the multiple stages, as in cement of the process, or downstream, where if you give free allowances, you may lose any, any price signal to consumers that this one thing is much more carbon intensive than the other. It, well, I've got modelling results I won't have time to show you, but to show the, the efficiency costs of free allocation for the society can be quite significant. Um, what about border adjustments? I just want to stress there are two very different dialogues about border adjustments. Uh, one, to be crude, is about how do we beat up countries that don't do what we want them to do on carbon, which... Uh, Slight oversimplification was the approach taken in US legislation, and it got the trade community very worried. Um, because it's an extraterritorial judgment on what is adequate action, and it's explicitly discriminatory. You are going to decide who you prefer, who you don't, who you charge, who you don't. Um, tackling carbon leakage through what we call border leveling, note a very deliberate use of a different term to say what you are after is leveling the carbon cost at the point of consumption, consumer choice. In principle, that's all you're doing. It's fundamentally non-discriminatory. You're saying we'll treat everyone the same. Wherever the stuff has come from, it's not our business to say was the policy adequate. Um, in this era of border adjustments, I think there are also two myths. One is to say, oh, this is absolutely the thing we need to do to protect our economies. I've got various points there about why that is quite a dangerous approach to take uh, in general, 
On the other hand, the other myth is that all border adjustments are discriminatory, they threaten trade relations, they'll bring down the world trading system. It's rubbish. I'm sorry, but it's complete rubbish. We already do border adjustments. We Value-added taxation, which 130 countries around the world use, is a system of border adjustments. You adjust the tax at the border, you reimburse on export. Petroleum excise taxes. Does anybody seriously expect the European Union or Japan or other countries that have high excise taxes on petroleum to say, oh, that's only for our domestic producers. Anyone that wants to bring in petroleum from the outside can do so for free. Of course not. We have border adjustments on petroleum. The logical thing to do in cement is simply to do the same thing in cement. You just say it has arrived at the border. It looks like cement. It feels like cement. It tastes like cement if you really want to lick it. And you say it must have emitted at least 0.7 tonnes of carbon per tonne of cement, and that's how much you've got to buy at the border. Very simple. WTO has no problem with it. And I've talked with WTO lawyers, and they say, goodness sake, I wish people would understand the WTO is a structure for defining what are acceptable and reasonable border adjustments. It is not a structure for banning them. And we need much more sophistication in this debate about what can you and can't you do with respect to trade law uh, in sensible ways in relation to carbon. It is quite a complicated story, uh, and I don't have time to cover it in depth, but I do think that it's essential. Because I think, if I, uh, that's the techie number about efficiency, impacts, etc. What it does show, incidentally, is border levelling is substantially more effective and more efficient than free allocation in terms of tackling carbon leakage and preserving incentives. The World Economic Forum published a, a, a report uh, at Cancun, launched by the Mexican Trade Minister, which again tried to hammer home the fact that there are circumstances in which this is a perfectly sensible and acceptable thing to do. But you've got to really know what you're doing, you've got to be very clear about the motivations, it's got to be non-discriminatory, etc. And there are some significant ambiguities. Uh, in Europe, our analysis is focused primarily on the issue of importers. In Australia, you'd want to be looking at reimbursement of carbon costs on export, which is, falls under different legal structures under WTO. Some final comments in this, just to stress in terms of numbers, on the left-hand side, you're really dealing with the dirty half dozen, if you want to call it that. The easiest place to start is with their direct emissions rather than their electricity-related emissions. Even just steel and cement together account for you know, something like 30% of all industrial emissions, and together they're four or five times global aviation emissions. Just think of the political effort that's been put into dealing with aviation emissions, in Europe at least, and it's about time we paid similar effort to deal with these sectors in appropriate and, and sensible ways. Um, I think this issue has been a sort of homegrown issue that people don't talk about too much in polite society, uh, I think that will start to change. I think we will see increasingly an understanding that the practice of free allocation is not sustainable for the long term. It may be very sensible as a transitional measure. I think, and this is my speculation, that it is likely to give way to border charges on imports in Europe by 2020. At the end of phase three, when Europe is really designing phase four of the trading scheme, I think they're going to realise you just cannot carry on giving free allowances to anything that threatens to move. It just doesn't add up as you get more ambitious in climate policy. The logical system would be for a carbon added regulatory structure. You basically check, has this paid carbon up before it arrived at our shores? If so, fine. If not, Europe will collect the revenues. Thank you very much. That creates some quite, incentive, quite interesting incentive properties. And I think that what follows from that, the key question is whether a low carbon coalition to which I referred and that I think is beginning to emerge is going to be purely driven by importers, because those are the easiest ones to act. As I said, it's no accident EU, California, India form the natural focus of a low-carbon coalition. I think it could be quite problematic if the world really divides between carbon rules for import-dependent countries and carbon rules for exporters, which is a danger of happening, because I think you would see a, a stronger and deeper and less, less well thought through and developed system of, of border adjustments as compared to if you had major producers and exporters in the low carbon coalition saying look we have legitimate interests here we're doing our best to decarbonize our economies we need international rules that actually help us rather than you know drive drive wedges internationally um, and so you know very much I, I hope that in its present debates australia will think carefully about that will think about the world that it could be facing in terms of import and exports in a decade from now and and will be at the table on, on the low carbon road
And that's really where I wanted to finish. Thank you very much. Uh, we started five minutes late, so I think we'll go with a few questions anyway. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Bobby Serini, uh, who's going to be looking at internet questions, although I think we have a blip there on whether we get any internet no, questions. No, yep. So let's get started. Straight away, remember, please raise your hand, stand up, state who you are, and so on. So who's going to have first question? The gentleman right here. Uh, Hongban from ABS. Um, uh, it's quite interesting that uh, you have um, proposed this uh, border tax adjustments uh, in place of assisting industries. Um, it's an interesting proposition. But would it be possible to um, assemble all the required data to determine the emission uh, embodied on every single commodity traded in the world? No. I, I can elaborate. <laughs> I just wanted to be really clear that yeah. that's not what I was suggesting. Um, All right, if you could elaborate a little yeah. bit. Um, two, two, two points. First, uh, I, all these things we need to think of as evolutionary processes in our economic and political systems. Um, you therefore start where it makes sense and where is most needed, which is actually the cement sector, in my view, because it has the biggest problems around free allocation and it's the easiest one for the reasons I indicated. It's a single process, broadly, we make cement in similar ways everywhere and it's a single product, most cement is like most other cement. Um, therefore, you can adopt the really simple approach of saying, well, if it looks like cement, feels like cement, that's kind of 0.7 tons of, of CO2 allowances you need to buy, please. You've not asked a single question about where did this come from or how was it made. You have no data need at all other than knowing that it is cement. Um, and that's basically how we treat petroleum excise duties. Um, obviously, I'm simplifying a little bit here because you've got to measure and you've got to make sure everything's mixed up. There are technical measurement issues, but frankly, a lot of them are no different from what we do in customs anyway, where you have to know what the country is importing and exporting and which tax regime it falls under, if any, and so forth. Um, now, I think in this area, where things get really interesting is when you then try and take a next step. And I think the next step probably uh, awaits that you, you try and set that level at pretty much the best plants in Europe so that it satisfies the gap treatment of n not just non-discriminatory, but also we're not treating importers any or to worse than the best things in Europe. And you wait, and there will be innovation in the cement sector. I mean, there are radical, very interesting innovations in the cement sector. Some companies sort of say on their, I don't talk about it too much because they don't want to undermine their negotiating position in allocation negotiations, but actually we all know they're working on radical low carbon cement technologies, of which the most radical involves magnesium catalyst processes in which you suck the carbon into the cement from the air rather than grind it out of the rocks, and, and cement becomes a negative emissions product. None of those technologies are available at present, but you know, you wait until somebody knocks at your door and says, but hang on, why should I pay, why should I buy 0.7 tons of allowances? I've got a new technology which is only emitting 0.6, which Europe says, okay, prove it. And they come with a fully monitored, reported, verified trial of carbon emissions to the satisfaction of all the authorities, and you in fact have had negotiations, and say, okay, yeah, that's convincing, you've only got to buy 0.6. That is when life gets really interesting in trade law terms because you've entered a terrain in which what is charged is, is a function of how the stuff was made, which is PPM process territory where you're in slightly gray area in legal terms and it gets more complicated. But this is now a deal between two consenting adults in the trade world. This is not an importer saying they're being treated unfairly. And you must say, okay, does any country really want to mount a political legal challenge in very grey and uncertain areas to try and stop two parties doing what seems eminently reasonable and they're perfectly happy with it in themselves to agree. And that I think is the key next step because then you open a boundary to anyone who can produce a technology which is lower than the current you know, approximate best practice 
has a real incentive to prove it, produce all the monitored trial, etc. And then I think you really start getting interested in this world. Okay, thanks. We have time for two more, I think. We're just running very short. Uh, the gentleman just here. Neil Hamilton from ANU. Michael, I wanted to ask you a question about politics, not about economics. Uh, since returning to Australia a couple of weeks ago, it struck me that the political debate here is mired in irrationality, trivia and misinformation. Can you make some comments about your experience in the UK and in Europe about how the debate moved from those sorts of issues to where it is now? Mm. I, th I think a bit more study on this question would be interesting. I'm tempted to say it's partly luck. I think it's partly luck that, at least in the UK, the issue landed on the agenda with scientific workshops in the 80s that came to the culmination at a time when Maggie Thatcher was in power, uh, and for multiple reasons, including the fact that she was a scientist, she said, yeah, this looks pretty rigorous. They've clearly got a big problem here. And um, she basically was one of the first top-level politicians on the global stage to say, this is real, this is serious, we must do something about it. Helped tremendously that she was seen as the most right-wing Prime Minister Britain had had in a generation at least. And she brought business on side. She created the Advisory Council on Business and Environment. Business has been in the thick of policy development in the UK for two decades. They've had all the scientific briefings. They know it's a problem. They know that any, any rational society must end up regulating carbon. Therefore, the business interest is saying, look, can we please sit down and negotiate sensible rules which will give us a long-term strategic framing for how and where we can invest, knowing that the world is going to have to decarbonise. And against that backdrop, you think, well, what earth should this be a political? I mean, what earth should the physics of how much gas goes into the atmosphere and how much radiation it traps near the surface be a left-right issue? I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, and it's not like that right across Europe. There's still a bit of a divided debate in Germany with, with heavy industry. But by and large, Europe has maintained this as a non-political issue. There's a slight tension about you know, how environmental we want to be versus how much we want to protect existing economies, but even that's not left-right. The UK has had pretty much stable politics on climate change for 20 years, and that's been incredibly helpful. That, that's what led to the Climate Change Act, was thinking logically as a society, we have a big problem, it's a long-term strategic problem, it has a lot of uncertainties, but we need a roadmap to help his business invest. Um, and that led us to the Climate Change Act, and so I say, it was adopted with an enormous bipartisan majority in Parliament. Um, and, and I think that's incredibly beneficial, and I just don't, I don't know what to say about the Australian position. Someone asked me what the opposition policy was, I had to I have no, I don't have a clue, so I can't comment. Right, let's take one more question then. Uh, just right at the middle there. Uh, Idris Lyman from um, School of Computer Science at the ANU. Um, recently, uh, you mentioned that <coughs> the uh, mission trait scheme has um, proceeded uh, in learning by doing. There's been uh, some reports about um, the dangers um, that hacking has uh, posed into the whole system. So that's one of my question. The other one, uh, you identified the energy and building sectors as uh, key sectors where innovations can take place. Now, in the UK, what kind of incentives are there for sectors like the ICT or IT and telecom to take advantage uh, in order to, to make investments in those sectors? Thank you. Right. Um, I think the... Uh, on the innovation side of it first, I, I still think Europe is, is amongst there and it's getting better, but it's not done very well at the innovation story. I mean, the fact is we're being outclassed by China on low carbon innovation and we know it now. It's only really in the last year that that's been realised. Um, you, Europe has done pretty well in terms of some technologies, most obviously wind energy. Uh, though even that now rapidly being sort of uh, overtaken. Um, but I, I, th I think one of the interesting links that emerging is, is there were two sorts of problems, one of which was a very sort of neoclassical industry will do its own innovation, the UK is really bad at picking winners, et cetera, et cetera. 
which I think has given way to a rather more sophisticated recognition that there are structural failures in terms of incentives for innovate spillovers. And anyway, industry really needs a very deep belief the government is going to be jacking up the carbon price a lot if they're going to ensure their innovation is in a low carbon direction. So fixing the carbon price uncertainty is part of the answer to innovation. The other is you actually need to find money to spend on innovation. And that is where the link with the, with the emissions trading system comes in very strongly. Uh, so, for example, carbon capture and storage is a very expensive technology to trial. The industry won't trial it on its own. The way the ECCS is now funded in Europe is through EU emission allowances. You know, politically, whatever governments say about, oh, you should separate income streams and then have a perfect logical pattern of expenditure separate, that's not reality. That's not real politics. The deal is... We've moved the European trading scheme to full auctioning in the power sector. It's going to shed loads of money, which we will use to help the power sector innovate in decarbonisation. Um, on your uh, second uh, question, your other question, um, this report that we're, we're publishing, 10 Insights uh, from the EU ETS, covers some of the, the recent scandals as well as some of the, the earlier learning experiences. I mean, I, I think my view is, well, what did we expect? we're creating quite a complicated system that creates something very valuable called an allowance to emit carbon and you are going to get criminals that try and try and abuse it. We actually had a couple of different sorts of fraud started coming to the system. One was that despite the harmonisation that had gone on, countries were still treating EU allowances under different legal hats with respect to VAT and, and various companies got wise to the fact they could do things, get VAT and then disappear before anybody worked out who else next to be needed to be charged. Um, and then you had the computer hacking. And my attitude is, well, I seem to recall occasionally reading the papers about financial fraud. We still use money. Um, it comes with the terrain. You create something valuable, you've got to get the security of the systems to match it. Uh, and that, I think, is now being addressed in Europe. Right. Well, look, thanks very much. We really have run out of time now. Thanks for your patience. And let's thank Michael again for a really stimulating and challenging lecture. Thank you very much.